to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, and right before the message this evening, uh, the ladies from West Coast Baptist College will come and minister to us in song. So you pray for them as they come to sing. Good evening, my name is Emily Petraska, and I am a sophomore from Baltimore, Maryland, studying music education. Good evening, my name is Kaylin Yakel. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm a junior studying visual arts. Hello, I'm Phoebe Cox. I'm from New Smyrna Beach, Florida. I'm a junior studying elementary education, and at the piano is Hannah Lee from Heiko, China, and she's a sophomore studying music education. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine. Love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, so wonderful? Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. <clears throat> love beyond our human comprehending. Love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. Great redeeming love of Calvary. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus? Isn't the love of Jesus? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, so wonderful, oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me, wonderful it is to me, wonderful it is to me, to me. When the storm raged about them, the disciples were afraid. For the waves were high and the ship was tossed, they could not find their way. Then they awoke the Master, saying, Lord, please save us now. He rebuked the wind and the sea grew calm, and they all wondered how. God sees the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned. And just beyond the clouds, He sees clear skies. He seeks peace to the raging storm when peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow when we see only clouds. Like the man on the seated, I have called on God in prayer. When it seemed to me that all hope was gone and I was in despair, then I remembered what the Lord said when He called the troubled sea. And I know once more how He sees the storm. the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned, and just beyond the clouds he sees clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm, when peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow, when we see only clouds. And when the storms of life come crashing in and trouble me, I can feel God's arms around me, and He whispers, Let it be, let it be. God sees the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned. 
And just beyond the clouds he sees clear skies. He sings peace to the raging storm, but peace cannot be found. He already sees the rainbow when we see only clouds. Lord, I stand here dressed in righteousness. You clothe me with your holiness. I don't deserve you in anything I do. But Lord, I'll serve you to show my love to you. I stand amazed in the presence of your love. I stand amazed that you came down from above. I can't believe that one day I will be in the presence of my Father and for all eternity. <clears throat> when you came down to set this prisoner free, you took my hand and said, come walk with me. I remember the day you called my name. From that day forward, I've never been the same. I stand amazed in the presence of your love. I stand amazed that you came down from above. I can't believe that one day I will be in the presence of my Father and for all eternity. Second Corinthians, Second uh, Thessalonians, chapter, um, chapter number one tonight, and continuing with the message we began this morning. If you're able, I invite you to stand with me as we read together here in God's Word, beginning in verse number one of Second Thessalonians, chapter number one. The Bible says this: Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, 
as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is the manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we ask your blessing upon the message. Lord, as we focus our attention on this passage tonight, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things from thy law. Father, you know what we need tonight. And we ask that you would help us see you clearly. And that you would develop develop our Christian lives in such a manner that our faith would continue growing exceedingly. That we would continue becoming more like our Savior. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us tonight. Lord, help us. Again, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I'd like to draw your attention to the statement found in verse number 5. The statement we focused primarily upon this morning concerning the righteousness of our God. The Bible says in verse number 5, the righteous judgment of God. The righteous judgment of God. Remember the word righteous speaks of God's innocence. Uh, God is pure. God is holy. Everything God does, he does well. He does right. God never makes a mistake. He's never caught by surprise. God is never reactionary. God is always previous. And as we consider God in his righteousness, we also consider God in his judgment. Now the word judgment, if you recall, speaks of a tribunal. It's a court, if you would. A court that that accuses and condemns based upon divine law. God is the great lawgiver, isn't he? You and I are holding in our possession tonight the law of God. This is the standard by which God judges. The word of God is perfect, converting the soul. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We understand that God's word is true from the very beginning. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, but by taking heed thereto according to thy word. God's word is right. You and I are not. But God is always right. And God has a purpose, God has a plan, and all that he does. God has a purpose and a plan for you. And God is trustworthy. When we look at that statement in verse 5, when we consider the righteous judgment of God, it brings great comfort to our hearts. At least it does mine. As we read through chapter number one, it occurred to me 
that it is a very heavy chapter, isn't it? There's not a lot of pleasantries in chapter number one. It's talking about the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the outpouring of God's judgment upon sinful man. It's talking about the tribulation that God will bring. It's talking about the, the, the recompense that he, will, that he will give, the vengeance he will take against sinful men who've rejected him, who've rejected his son, who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's hard, isn't it? He speaks concerning the, the, the persecutions and the tribulations these Thessalonian believers are enduring. It, it appears, it appears... If we were just to take a, a quick glance and not just, just a simple glance, it looks as if nothing's working. That everything has gone awry. But the Lord reigns in our emotions. He refocuses our attention Upon himself. The righteous judgment of God. I had you write it down this morning. If you did not, shame on you. I'm going to give you another opportunity. Will you write down the statement somewhere in the margin of your Bible, somewhere in your notes tonight, that everything is going to be okay? This is the message God is conveying overwhelmingly in chapter number one. Church, I want you to realize tonight that it's going to be okay. Not because you and I are capable. Not because you and I perform to a certain extent. Not, be, not because we achieve, achieve some level of spirituality. It's going to be okay because God is good. And the Thessalonians need to hear this message. You and I need to hear this message. The Thessalonians, if you recall, they were, they were living in a time of great uncertainty. Between Paul's first letter and his second letter, someone had crept into the church, bringing with them false doctrine concerning the second coming of Christ, leading many to believe that they had missed the Lord, and they are, they are now in the midst of tribulation and, and waiting for the outpouring of God's wrath. And it's a time of great uncertainty, a time of, of question, a time of great attack. And Paul, under the inspiration of God, writes a letter at the perfect time and assures them that it's going to be okay. You know, every now and then, we need to hear that, don't we? The world's a mess, isn't it? Man, it's a mess. I was on a boat earlier this week. We were 20 miles off the shore of Emerald Isle, North Carolina. We were fishing, having a great time, and I thought, you know what? It's nice to not hear the news. It's nice to be separated from knowledge, isn't it? The, Solomon concluded that the abundance of knowledge brought with it an abundance of sorrow. We live in a world that is filled with information, that's filled with knowledge, but not the knowledge of God, not the knowledge of the holy, not the knowledge of what is good and what is right, but with the knowledge that is discouraging and defeating, that is opposing and upsetting, 
but God is good, isn't he? And in our lives, in our lives, we have seasons through which we journey. Seasons of great stress. Seasons of great anxiety and worry and fear where the emotions of our soul run rampant and lead us to question the faithfulness of God. But God is always faithful. God is always right. God is always good. This morning, we looked and we saw the righteousness of God demonstrated in two prophetic events. We looked at the uh, at God's righteousness demonstrated in the tribulation. The tribulation time referenced in verse, verse number 6 is a demonstration of, of the righteous judgment of God. He's not wrong for it. It's necessary. We also saw the the righteousness of God, which boggles our minds when we consider that he counts us worthy of the kingdom of God. Concerning the marriage supper and concerning the judgment seat of Christ, God is righteous in his judgment. Tonight, I'd like to share with you two more truths found in this chapter. Verses 7 through 10. I want to show you what many would assume to be a negative, And then we'll conclude with what we all believe to be the positive. But we see the judgment of God demonstrated in the revelation of Christ. In last, last January, and in this coming January, just I'm going to plug that again. Uh, we'll be we were in Israel. We'll be going back in 2025. And I remember again for the third time standing in Megiddo, looking across the Valley of Jezreel, the Valley of Armageddon, and off in the distance you see Nazareth. You look off, you see Mount Tabor. What a a beautiful, beautiful place. But this is where the revelation of God occurs. The revelation of God is the second phase of the second coming, the final portion, the final part of the second coming of Christ. Remember, 1 Thessalonians deals with the rapture of the church and the great hope we have in the Lord's coming for us. In 2, Corinthians, in 2 Thessalonians, the Lord is returning at the revelation. 1 Thessalonians, he's coming for the saints. 2 Thessalonians, he's coming with the saints. What a wonderful Savior! but we see the righteous judgment of God. You look with me, if you would, verse number seven. He says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Notice, when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the God, I'm sorry, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Church, the revelation of Jesus Christ is a terrible thing. I want you to look back to Revelation chapter number 19. Holding your place here. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. I don't know if you've, if you've ever noticed this in your Bible reading, but there are, two, there are two suppers in Revelation chapter number 19. In Revelation chapter 19, in verse number, uh, verse number 9, we find the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Bible says, and, uh, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, you and I, that's for us. That'll take place during the tribulation. 
you and I will be gathered together with Christ around his table. It'll be a glorious receiving of, is, won't it be? A wonderful time. But then we look and we find in verse number 17, there's another supper. A supper that none of us want to be part of. The Bible refers to it as the supper of the great God. So when you're, when Christ returns, he's going to do exactly as Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He's going to come flaming fire, taking vengeance. It's a time of, of death. It's a time of destruction. And as you stand on the, on the top of Tel Megiddo, the Bible tells us that it is there where the blood will run to the horse's bridle. Napoleon Bonaparte made this statement concerning the Valley of Jezreel. It's the perfect battlefield. And it is. But there the armies of the Antichrist will be massed. They will be positioned against the people of Israel. But Christ will come. And he will destroy them. Look what the Bible says again in Revelation chapter 19. The Bible says this in um, verse number 11. And I, and, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And notice, ironically, I think not ironically, but purposely, intentionally, the Bible says, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Remember, our, our God is a God of righteous judgment. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the Bible says, In his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a, a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, with two, uh, that, uh, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of all mighty God. I don't know if you've ever watched someone glean grapes and, and press grapes. Unless you watched I Love Lucy <laughs> when they were <laughs> jumping around in the, in the wine press there, chucking grapes at one another, you know. But they tre you tread, you tread grapes. And you do it barefoot, lest you break the seed of the grape and ruin the wine. But it's a picture, the Bible speaks of the blood of the grape. So when God says he, he, he when God speaks of the, the wine press, the, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, God is treading upon the earth, in a sense. This is a time of great judgment, a time of great despair, a time of, of overwhelming and catastrophic death. But he's not mistaken for it. Because he's exercising, he's demonstrating his righteous judgment. And the Bible goes on in verse number 16, and he says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God. That ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. What a spectacle it will be as our Lord, as our Lord returns and just the word of his mouth defeats the army and wins the victory. Interestingly enough, I don't believe the Lord sets foot in Megiddo. Look in, in Acts chapter number 1, if you would. In Acts chapter 1, what a glorious day it was for the disciples standing atop the Mount of Olives, Christ speaking to them, Christ again in verse 8 commissioning them to preach the gospel to all men, to all nations. And the Bible says in verse number 9, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And I believe the Lord will return on the Mount of Olives. Look in Zechariah. Chapter number 14. Zechariah chapter 14. The Bible says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. What is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is spoken of by the minor prophets. It's not referring to the rapture, but referring to the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the day of the Lord. It's a terrible day. It's an awesome day. It's a dreadful day. It's a day of great deliverance for the children of Israel as their Messiah comes, as they receive him, as they rejoice and enter into the kingdom that he had promised for them. But it's also a day of destruction for those who believe not. It's bittersweet. The Bible speaks of the day of the Lord. He goes on, he says, And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled, and the women ravished it. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the, from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. Aren't you thankful for the victory that Christ will win? And then it happens. At some point, he rides from Megiddo. South to Jerusalem. To the Mount of Olives, where he, from whence he ascended to heaven. And it is there that he physically returns. His feet touch down on on the Mount of Olives. And there's, there's a physical sign promised concerning this. What will happen? The Bible says in verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem 
on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come. Would you mark that statement? And the Lord my God shall come. And all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And the Bible says, and it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem. And if, for sake of time, Jesus is living water. He is the living water. Church, it's healed. It's healed. All of it. Everything. is healed by the living water of Jesus Christ. The desert is restored. The waters are healed. Christ rules and reigns in righteousness. Yes, with a rod of iron, but he rules and reigns in righteous judgment. God is good. But there's a promise. Look back in 2 Thessalonians chapter number two, chapter number 1. In verse number 7, remember, everything's going to be okay. That's the Lord's message to his people. It's going to be fine. God always does what's right. Always. And God promises you and me something. Something that we long for. Something all men are seeking, whether they admit it or not. Something the human heart craves. Something that is only found in Christ. And we see it in verse number 7, and perhaps the pinnacle of God's righteous judgment. Look in verse 7. The Bible says this, And to you who are troubled, you know what, we're troubled, aren't we? We're a needy people. Life is filled with turmoil. Life is filled with unrest, with question, with worry, with strife, with fear. But God gives you and me something. What is it that he offers? What is it that he provides? What is it that he allows us to enter into? His rest. And to you that are troubled, rest with us. God's righteous judgment is demonstrated by the rest he provides his children. Look, in, look back in Revelation chapter number 6. What is this rest? When does it occur? You and I, we can have rest today. Rest in the Christian life is not the absence of problems. It's the peace we have in our hearts knowing that the Lord is in control and that everything will be okay. But in Revelation chapter number 6, the Bible says this in verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Church, you and I have rest. We have rest. 
We are, we're not participants in the tribulation. We don't have to worry about the judgment of God at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We enjoy the rest, the complete rest. We don't know what rest is. I've been asked many times, say, do you feel rested? I said, what does that mean? We went on vacation with four kids, right? Rest. You know, rest means you're no longer weary, you know, that you're no longer tired. It means that, you're, that you've slept well, right? That you're no longer, you've, you're ready to attack the day. Right? You're well rested. But you and I will be at rest with the Lord. Church, there's a great comfort, there's a great promise that God gives. And all of this stems from Christ. One day you and I will be called home to glory. We will enter and the rest of our Savior. May I say, you can know the rest of God today. You and I, we need to learn how to rest in the Lord. We all have troubles, don't we? Man, there's a few days, is full of trouble, isn't he? Our lives are filled with trouble and worry and concern. But how do you rest in God? That's a real question. I'm hoping that one of you have the answer. How do we do it? You know how we do it? We just choose to focus on Christ. We have to make the conscious decision. We must be determined not so much, we we can't ignore problems. Things happen in life that must be dealt with. They must be handled. But dealing with them and dwelling upon them are two different things. The Lord has not called you and me to dwell upon our problems. He's called us to dwell with Him. To abide in Christ. And when we abide in Christ, when our focus is upon Him, when our trust is in Him, when we have surrendered all to Him, I mean, because how much of th- how many things in life can you really control? We're foolish to think we control anything. When we're fully surrendered, when we've given it all over to God, that's when we rest. The church in Thessalonica, man, they were worried. But our Lord's a God of righteous judgment. And instead of dwelling upon the problem, the uncertainty, the false belief, let's rest in Him. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Church, it's going to be okay. If your guy doesn't get elected in November, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Why? Because God's in control. And he doesn't need any of us. We have him. Let's keep our eyes upon him. Won't you look to God? 
Are you overwhelmed tonight? Are you fearful? Are you discouraged? Look to Christ. Take your hands off. Trust in the Lord. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed.